This is Janet Hill at the Rock Island County Health Department. Thank you for joining us today. It is one o'clock on uh, November 24th. Uh, this is our only briefing scheduled for this week. We wish you a happy and healthy uh, Thanksgiving. Today we will be talking with Linda Fredrickson of EMS and Travis Noyd of Moline Fire to talk about how the pandemic is straining our EMS system. First of all, let's start off with some Rock Island County numbers, Rita. Good afternoon. Unfortunately, today in Rock Island County, we are reporting three additional deaths of COVID-19. A woman and two men, all in their 90s, passed away at long-term care facilities in our county. And again, we offer our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of these individuals. Our total deaths to date now is 137 for Rock Island County. In addition, there are uh, 125 new cases of COVID-19 today, which now brings our total to 7,908 cases. And there are currently 89 people hospitalized in Rock Island County with COVID-19. In Scott County, the Iowa Department of Public Health reports 10,459 cases and 75 deaths. Thanksgiving's two days away and we're at the bleakest point yet in this pandemic. On Sunday, the Iowa Department of Public Health announced the COVID-related deaths of six Scott County residents. One of these residents was a young adult. This is the first death of a Scott County resident under the age of 40 due to COVID-19. We extend our deepest sympathy to the families of these residents that we have lost. The hospitalizations and deaths we are seeing in the community are not limited to one age group. They are widespread. I'm concerned about what holiday gatherings this week will mean for spread in our community. I fear we'll see a further spike in cases in the following weeks as COVID-19 will undoubtedly spread across the Thanksgiving table of those who choose to gather with extended family and friends. Our healthcare system is stressed and I fear what will happen if demand increases. Our hospitals can't weather another doubling of daily cases. So today I urge every resident in Scott County to make the tough but necessary decision to avoid Thanksgiving gatherings with extended family and friends. Do that this year so that there isn't an empty seat at your table next year. Your decision could very well save a life, maybe even your own. Today, we'll hear from another healthcare system party, local emergency medical service providers. These providers play a critical role in emergency medicine, and I want us to take the role that they play for what it is essential. Thank you, Ed and Nita, for sharing um, that basic information from Public Health today. As Ed mentioned, we have our partners here on the call. So Linda Fredrickson with Medic EMS is here joining us, and Travis Noyd with the City of Moline Fire. Um, we're grateful you're both able to join us um, during the craziness that's going on right now with your responses and things. We do have a couple of questions where I'm going to field to each of you. So feel free um, just to have a conversation with us about this. And then at the end, we'll see if there's anything additional you'd like to add. Um, first question, I'll start with Travis. What types of challenges are the increasing COVID-19 positivity rate and case numbers causing our EMS providers? What are you seeing on your side? Um, well, bro, just <clears throat> when we did this call before, I kind of ran the numbers along with Linda and uh, just a representation of what Moline Fire has on the Rock Island County side, the Illinois side. Uh, our total number of positive COVID patient transports that we've had, which we've been keeping track of, uh, we're now over 85 patients that we are aware of that were positive COVID uh, patients that tested at the hospital. Um, of that, 51%. Uh, 51% of those patients, <clears throat> excuse me, or 31 in November uh, were transported in November. So over half of the, of the COVID positive patients that we transported, we just transported in this month and the month's not even over yet. So I'm sure there'll be a few more. 
uh, there was 14 in October, which was 17%. So 17 and 36% of the COVID positive transports we had have occurred just in the last two months as compared to when this all began, when we thought things were really bad. Uh, obviously, we weren't aware of how bad things were down yet. So that's been a stress. Uh, stress on our equipment, our per per personal protective equipment, such as gloves, masks. Um, it started out masks were hard to get, but now it's turned into a fact that we can't get gloves from our traditional uh, EMS uh, suppliers. So we have to get creative. I'm not sure what Linda's doing on her end, but uh, we've uh, kind of maxed out our Amazon account uh, here at the fire department just to get gloves. So it's, uh, been a, it's, been a, it's been tricky that way also, and just making sure we have enough to provide protection for all of our individuals. And then just, it goes back to like Dr. Rivers said, there's stress on the providers. Uh, the paramedics, the medics, they get stressed, you know, they, and they go home, they worry about their loved ones and, you know, they want to, they want to be safe too, you know, and uh, it's, it's touched our department, about 10% of our department has, uh, you know, at some point either had some, uh, some form of COVID or had some COVID uh, positive tests, or, or maybe they're even taking care of family members that are positive. So they're stressed that way also. So um, just a kind of a wide gamut from supplies to personnel issues. Um, so, it doesn't seem like it's getting better like we were hoping, but maybe, you know, we just, we keep plugging away, so. Thank you. And Linda, I'll let you answer that same question about challenges that you're seeing through Medic. Definitely many, many challenges. Uh, we're starting to see more and more patients in the community. Certainly, we saw huge concentrations in October, and it was hard to believe that it would get worse in November, but indeed it has. Um, to date, we have transported 650 COVID positive transport patients. Um, just as a little bit of a comparison, Medic EMS does not just respond to the 911s, but we also do um, other scheduled transfers. So as we see our local healthcare resources become uh, full and overwhelmed, uh, they're doing the best they can with converting single bed uh, units at our local hospitals into double bed units um, to accommodate all of these COVID patients. When they don't have the beds available, we have to take patients out of town. So we're going as far as Des Moines, um, Waterloo, Burlington, Chicago, Rockford, many, many places. Of those 650 transports, some of those patients have been transported more than once. They may have had a transport into the hospital initially uh, on their 911 request then they may have had another transport maybe to long-term care to recover or even out of town. So um, we're starting to see lots of issues with not only resource or bed availability, but also as Travis mentioned, staff illness you know, uh, issues with um, individuals who work for Medic EMS. They may become sick. Um, I know the last time that we talked together on a press conference, I think I said the days of coming to work with a cold were over. And the problem is now when people have cold symptoms or this fall when they had allergy symptoms, we really had to quarantine them from work uh, for a period of time and get COVID testing to make sure that they were safe and healthy to come back to work. Um, we are definitely burning through lots of personal protective equipment and again, that is a strain on you know, physical resources as well as personnel resources. We are thankful for the cooler weather. In July, when we were putting on the impermeable <clears throat> gowns, a lot of our people were getting um, just extremely uh, overheated. And I'm seeing Travis have a little smile there, but I don't think I was ever so happy to see the summer close because I knew that our people were really uh, sometimes becoming ill just from having to wear the personal protective equipment for extended periods of time. Thank you. Um, and, you know, Travis, this is not our first surgeon, first time we've had a surge in cases, but we know things are so much higher right now. Is your agency better off or worse off now than where we were prior to um, this, probably back in July? I think, um, Brooke, for that question, I think education and knowledge wise, I think we're better off. I think we know more about it. Um, yeah, and, but with knowing more about it, I think sometimes people become too relaxed around it and that makes us maybe worse off because we're not, 
uh, like I said, a little bit haphazard about how we approach things. So I think it's kind of a double-edged uh, sword there. So we're, we're better educated, we're more aware of what it is and how it's, how it's working, but then uh, there's that, whatever, what they call it, the, the wear that people have and they're just kind of tired of it. But uh, so we worry about people staying diligent and that's just as much as my employees and as a general public. So, you know, uh, I, I would say it's probably where we're the, we have the most difficulty is just keep people um, vigilant. Uh, supply wise and stuff, you know, we're, we're doing okay that way. Uh, like I said, we're just getting creative. So um, we're just, we're holding, I think we're just holding, holding the course and, uh, you know, hopefully with vaccinations and that coming around the corner, maybe things will start to take a turn for the better. Thank you. Linda, what are your thoughts? I would agree 100% with Travis. I think that when this all started, um, I think it all, you know, we all made sure that we were re-examining our current status of our personal protective equipment, making sure that we had adequate supplies. We all know that orders that we had put in for personal protective equipment with our traditional vendors back in December and January have still gone unfilled. So uh, we very much on both sides of the river appreciate the efforts of the emergency management agencies who have done an outstanding job of working together to secure adequate personal protective equipment for our first responders who are truly the tip of the spear um, out in the community. Um, we're going into homes where people many times um, have been sick. They're sick enough that they aren't even aware that they should be calling 911 um, and are critically ill sometimes when we go in to pick them up. So I think from a preparedness aspect, we're probably better prepared, just as Travis said, from knowledge education and PPE packaging and a refresher on how to use it. But in terms of, you know, folks are just getting tired of COVID, they want it to go away. Uh, they're concerned about their loved ones, and I think that there has been some wear and tear on all healthcare providers and public safety members at this point. So, Travis, what concerns do you have for the future if COVID-19 continues to worsen? What, what does that mean for the response that you provide in the community, the services, um, your staff? Um, well, number one, obviously, we're concerned about the health of our staff. Um, we haven't been... Uh, overwhelmed by any means and we, we're maintaining like we should but then you know you, 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 get, you get concerned that you know again if if people aren't don't keep vigilant you know staff may become lazy and and you know not at work but they may catch you know get sick while at home or doing other activities so I, I get concerned about that the lack of people of, of the staff or even the community just kind of shutting it all off and just like Linda said you know being tired of it and weary of it and just wanting it to go away and then just saying, heck, the heck with it, I'm gonna go ahead and do whatever I wanna do. I think that's a big, big concern for the community that we, you know, again, it goes back to taking care, taking care of each other. And I think we need to make sure that we keep that in the forefront of our mind, especially with the holidays coming around, that we, we really need to take care of each other. And we need to do that by, you know, doing what is recommended by CDC, by public health and, all those measures. So moving forward, that's my biggest concern. Like I said, we'll continue to find the equipment we need to operate and to pro provide and serve. I just worry that the community uh, aren't heeding the requests of public health and, and, and doing what's being asked of them. And if, if any time it needs to happen, just with these numbers that, that we talked about the last two months, those numbers right there should be enough to, to wake anybody up and realize that this is not going away and this is, it's getting worse and we have to be smarter and better about it for each other. And Linda, what are you seeing um, as your concerns for the future? At, at what point, or I guess maybe not at what point, but what does it look like if your services are not able to continue in the same manner you've been able to up until now? I can see that healthcare resources are become very strained uh, and they have been very strained for the last month or so. I'm concerned that not only were, will there potentially be some issues with local hospital bed availability, but staffing availability. Um, we are trying to decompress the hospitals by taking patients to other locations that have available beds as quickly as we can. 
but we have to realize that we have to have enough ambulances to respond to the 911 demands too. I would say that probably we have 90 dispatches a day. Um, those have been soaring up to 115, 120 a day. And I'm gonna say that a third of those patients that we're responding to are what we would term as isolation alert patients. There's more time on task because of the additional personal protective equipment that is required. We wanna make sure that we decontaminate our ambulances and make sure that they're back in service so they're nice and clean so other patients don't get COVID in the healthcare environment. And I can see slowed response you know, from EMS providers across the nation here because they're time on task. So we want, you know, we want our community to be patient as we respond to their 911 requests. I can tell you that about 10 days ago, as a crew was getting into their personal protective equipment, they were assaulted by a family member because they felt that it was taking our crew too long to get into the home to take care of their loved one. So our community is very, very stressed. But we do have to understand right now that it's gonna take a little bit more time. So I'm just concerned about resources and personnel availability at this time. So Travis, one final question for you both. From your perspective, what critical actions do you need our community members to take to support the services that you provide? Uh, um, I think I kind of met, I answered that in your last question, but uh, and Linda brought up a good point. I love the quote. You said, the days of coming to work sick uh, should no longer be. So be aware of your, of, your, of your health. You know, if you don't feel well, if you have a fever, if you have a cough, if it's cold-like symptoms, you need to stay home, monitor yourself, check your temperature, you know, think about isolating and, you know, think about what you could possibly pass on to somebody else. Um, wear your mask, social distance, uh, try to keep your, like my family calls it, we try to keep our circle really small, you know, just our tight family and then, uh, you know, just trying not to open it up too big and, and uh, allowing yourself to be just vulnerable so I it's difficult we understand that um, but stay home this year and then next year or maybe we'll do some crazy party in, in in July when we can all celebrate you know when this finally hopefully takes the right turn so stay home mask up social distance it's not the message really hasn't changed uh, Linda brought up a good point be patient with your 911 service we're we're providing the same care it just might take us a little bit longer and just you know take care of each other go ahead linda anything you'd like to add to that um yes i, I think travis summarized really well but this is the real deal here we are getting hit hard not only in our nation but we're getting hit hard in the quad cities right now so everybody needs to pay attention this is getting worse it's not getting better. And it's up to every single one of us to be responsible, to be respectful of other people in our community, and to understand that the most important thing you can do is wear your mask, distance, avoid groups, try to use your online options. Everybody did this at the beginning and we saw our numbers go down. We need to pretend like we're back in March and April again and hopefully we can turn this around in our communities here in the Midwest. But this is it. Um, it's up to you to really try to kind of help our community get through this. We've got a vaccine on the way. Once that gets going, hopefully we can turn everything around. But until we get that going, it's all up to us in the community to make responsible decisions, have good manners and respect others. I always think of uh, your mask like your underwear. Ed's going to kill me for saying this, but if you wouldn't go out in public without your underwear, don't go out in public without your mask. That is just a great quote to end this on, so thank you both so much. Um, I'll give it a minute and see if our media partners have any questions. I did have one follow-up um, to what you both had said in regards to you know, some very ill COVID patients. Um, do you have any remarks or suggestions you're providing to those who might be at home or um, do we need them to know don't delay your care don't delay those calls if you need additional um, support at this time to get through that um, i would say absolutely 100 um, percent we have um, many patients that you'll walk in and you can see they're they're critically ill they're having severe respiratory distress 
they literally have had a color change. And when you're asking the family members, how long have they been sick? Um, sometimes they've been sick for days and unable to get off the sofa in the living room. They're so weak. Many of these patients are falling. Um, they might not necessarily be coughing and they may not even have a fever, but we're seeing this really impact mostly the elderly population uh, severely. Many of these patients are admitted at our local hospitals and we can tell you that all the ventilators are maxed out right now. Many of these patients have breathing tubes and ventilators. So don't wait too long. Don't be afraid to call 911. We're happy to come out and check you even if you think you don't need to go. And um, please call us if you need us. Please dial 911. Yeah, Linda pretty much uh, summarized it real well again. She, um, you know, don't wait. That's what we're here for. We're here to take care of you. Don't hesitate. Um, you know, because the longer you wait, the worse, uh, the worse it's going to get and without definitive care. So please make sure you call um, and let us, let us help take care of you. And uh, that's what we're here for. We're there for you. Well, thank you both so much for your time today for sharing um, this information. You're invaluable to our community, so we want to continue supporting you. Um, not seeing any additional questions from our partners on the call from the media, we'll go ahead and conclude for today. Uh, the recording will be posted on the Scott County Health Department's website as well as shared on social media. Um, again, there will be no call on Thursday um, in observance of the Thanksgiving holiday. Wishing you all a very safe and healthy um, time off, and we'll talk with all of you again next week. Thank you very much. Thanks. Wear your mask. Thanks.